a requirement, but. <laughs> well, good morning. My name is Emily. I'm the lead pastor here. And we have been going through the book of Luke for almost the last two years now. Um, so we are almost, we are almost at the end. Uh, we, we are planning to hit the resurrection passage on Easter Sunday. So that's exciting. We're looking forward to that. Um, but where we're at right now is actually the last 24 hours of Jesus's life about. Um, and so what we're about to hear is kind of some of Jesus's last words. Um, well, I guess for the next couple of weeks, we'll be hearing some of Jesus's last words because we are going to stretch it out. Um, but where we're at today is this Wednesday and Thursday of Holy Week, which we typically celebrate the week leading up to Easter. So we'll be, send, we'll be spending a lot of time the next few weeks in Holy Week. So just wrap your head around that. Easter is coming, but Easter is really coming on Sunday mornings when we're celebrating, when we're remembering this. And so we remember that as we started almost two years ago, way back at the beginning of Luke, we learned about Jesus's birth we learned about Jesus's upbringing, and we learned a lot about Jesus's ministry and kind of his summary statement um, of his thesis statement of why he's, he was here on earth. Um, we found in Luke 4 where he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the downtrodden will be freed from their oppressors, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And then we saw Jesus carry that out, right? We saw him heal people. We saw him deliver people from demons. We saw him bring freedom, bring um, equality, bring justice. And we saw this carried out in Jesus's life. And so now, like I said, we're reaching the end of that point. Um, and through Jesus's ministry, as he became more and more popular, he also has been receiving more and more opposition, right? As we've been seeing, he is really upending the system of life that the people we're living in in that time, especially the Jews, especially the religious um, teachers. And so he's been facing some opposition. So where we jump in in this story, we kind of see, are going to see some of that, some of that tension. So I'm going to read our passage for today. It's a little bit long. It's 23 verses, but I just encourage you to settle in and listen. The words will be up on the screen as well if you wish to follow along. Otherwise, I encourage you to just, to just listen. This is starting in Luke 22, verses 1 to 23. The festival of unleavened bread, which begins with the Passover celebration, was drawing near. The leading priests and teachers of religious law were actively plotting Jesus' murder. But they wanted to kill him without starting a riot, possibly a possibility they greatly feared. Then Satan entered Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve disciples, and he went over to the leading priests and captains of the temple guard to discuss the best way to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted that he was ready to help them, and they promised him a reward. So he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so they could arrest him quietly when the crowds weren't around. Now the festival of unleavened, unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lambs were sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, go prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. Where do you want us to go? They asked him. He replied, as soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is the place. Go ahead and prepare our supper there. They went off to the city and found everything, just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover supper there. Then at the proper time, Jesus and the twelve apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have looked forward to this hour with deep longing, anxious to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. 
For I tell you now that I won't eat it again until it comes to fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine, and when he had given thanks for it, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had thanked God for it, he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This wine is the token of God's new covenant to save you, an agreement sealed with the blood I will pour out for you. But here at this table, sitting among us as a friend, is the man who will betray me. For I, the Son of Man, must die, since it is part of God's plan. But how terrible it will be for my betrayer. Then the disciples began to ask each other which of them would ever do such a thing. So I want to point out a couple things about this passage. First, I think, you know, the events of what happens here, if we've heard this often over the years, becomes familiar to us. But as we really think about this, it reads kind of like this drama narrative, right? So you have at the beginning of the passage where this plot is forming, right, around people plotting to kill Jesus. We see Judas involved in that, one of his disciples. And it's like this, okay, there's something happening that we as the readers know about, but then as we go on, it's not necessarily the people in the story know about that, right? So we as the readers have this kind of insight into, ooh, there's this plot going on here, but we don't know if Jesus and his disciples know that this plot is going on. So then the story carries out, right? Jesus is sharing this meal that he's really excited to share with his friends, with his followers. And it's almost like it sets you up as the reader to want to be like, Jesus, like, there's a traitor amongst you. Like, be careful, beware. And, but he just goes and he is, you know, sharing this intimate meal with friends. And then at the very end of the passage, we hear that Jesus knows, right? That plot didn't, um, like, Jesus was aware. Jesus was aware of the plot, and it, um, it didn't surprise him. And so I think, you know, as we think about that, um, we can focus, we could focus a lot on, you know, what caused Judas to do that and, what does it mean that Satan entered him? And honestly, there's not a lot of information in the scriptures about what that actually means. Scholars debate about that. We could spend hours debating on that. But what I do want to focus on is that there is some, it's pointing to some other spiritual element here, right? It's not just a human versus Jesus, God human, right? It's like there's forces of evil that are also working against Jesus and his plot and his um, ministry. And so what I think this is really pointing to and what we'll continue to see over the next couple weeks is that you can put up, oh, do we not have slides? Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah, God's and his kingdom and his plan cannot be deceived or thwarted by the forces of evil, right? So this narrative kind of reads like, um, well, who has ever seen Home Alone? Anyone ever seen that movie, right? It's about a kid who gets forgotten. It's really terrible, actually. Like his family goes on vacation over Christmas and they just forget him. And <laughs> so he's in the house alone. There are these two burglars that are trying to break into the house. And time after time, the kid thwarts the burglar's plans, right? The burglar's thinking that every time that they're going to outsmart this kid, but every time this kid is one step ahead of them, and of course, in the end, the kid does outsmart the burglars. And so it's like these forces of evil cannot outsmart this kid's plans and his, um, um, his yeah, just his plans to, um, to outwit them. And so we see kind of that parallel in this story as well, right? Let's think even further back, right? Looney Tunes, Looney Tunes, Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner. How many times 
How many times did the coyote try to outsmart the, the roadrunner? And every time the roadrunner's just like, nope. Not only is he willing is he like uh not not being able to be outwitted by him, but it's just like he's unfazed by it, right? And I think we see that in this story as well, too, right? It almost is like Jesus, uh, like as we find out, he knows, but he is unfazed. And he's able to focus and be present on this last meal with his friends, which it says that he was deeply longing for, that he was eagerly excited to have with them and eager to eat this meal with them. And now there are a couple parts of this meal, I think, that we, because we're not first century Jews, kind of miss out on some of the context and some of the significance of it, um, but that his friends, who he was sharing the meal with, would have been very well aware of. And so one of those specific contexts um, of significance is the fact that it was the Passover meal. And so the Passover was a meal that God had commanded the Jews to celebrate after their exodus from Egypt. So this is back at the beginning, beginning story of the Bible, if you remember from the book of Exodus, the Israelites were slaves under Egyptian rule. And God sent Moses, right, to free the slaves from Egypt. But Moses needed Pharaoh to agree with his plan, right, and actually let his people go. But Pharaoh was pretty resistant to that. So God sent 10 plagues, and the 10th plague was this um, plague of the death of the firstborns in Egypt, right? So God told the Israelites to sacrifice on this night a spotless lamb to mark their doorposts with its blood, and then the Lord passed over Egypt, right? But the houses that were marked with the blood of the lamb, he passed over and saved the firstborn sons from death. And so it was this plague that uh, was ultimately the one that prompted Pharaoh to actually let the Israelites go. Um, and so it was the initiation of their freedom, of their deliverance out of Egypt. And so this Passover meal was significant because as they're eating this, there's kind of this symbolism going on where Jesus is pointing to the fact that he is actually the Passover lamb. That through what he's about to go through, he is the spotless one, right? The one who has not sinned, the one who is free of all blemish, that he will, through his blood, be that ultimate fulfillment of, from death, from the, the death that sin causes, and bring us into this new freedom. Um, and so there's this symbolism of this Passover meal with Jesus being actually the Passover lamb. And so he uses this existing tradition of the Passover to kind of initiate this new tradition, which is why we celebrate communion every week in the Lord's Supper um, that points to this new covenant that Jesus inaugurates, which is the second piece of context. So Jesus references um, the new covenant in his blood as he drinks the cup. And this concept of a covenant is one that we might not be as familiar with. Maybe you've heard of marriage referred to as a covenant, which um, is, is true. And so the Bible Project defines covenant as a relationship between two partners who make binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. They're often accompanied by oaths, signs, and ceremonies, and they defined obligations and commitments, but they're different from a contract because they are relational and personal. So covenants are a way that God uh, really related to his people back um, throughout the story of the Bible. Um, 
So we saw at the beginning of the Bible, and we touched on this last week, how at the beginning God created um, this garden where man and God were meant to coexist as one. There was no separation between them, um, but then man made some poor choices, and it, sin entered into the picture. And so sin um, is now in human nature, and God still wanted, deeply wanted, that relationship with man, but God is holy, and God's holiness and sin cannot coexist, right? So, so God created this system um, called, through covenants, called the law, to really allow him to continue to, re to relate to humans, to us, even though there's this sin now living inside of us. And so God just deeply longed for that relationship, but um, to protect us, to protect his holiness from completely destroying us because of that sin inside of us, um, he implemented this system of the law and of covenants. And really the point of the covenant was to show the Israelites how to love God. Like it wasn't just a system of rules. It wasn't just this, you need to do this on this day and this on this day just for the sake of obedience. But it was in the context that the Israelites were living in. Um, this was how they were to love God. So part of that was he set up this sacrificial system. So when the people sinned, right, we, we are sinful people. We had a sin nature. And so they needed a way to atone for those sins so that they could still have some sort of relationship with God. And he set that up through the sacrifice of animals. So it's all laid out in the books of Leviticus and all those fun ones that you like to read um, about <laughs> the different sins and the different laws and what needs to be done and the different offerings and the different sacrifices. But he set it up so that there was some way for that sin to be atoned for um, so that we could have some relationship with God. But the Israelites, the Jews, knew that ultimately that wasn't really working, right? Like they, <laughs> they were not great at following this. And so they rebelled, they turned away, they um, were constantly having to be put into, you know, kind of time out, exile. And then, but God in his grace would always turn back to them. He would always turn back to them. But that wasn't like the ultimate system, right? There, there was something that was like, this isn't quite working. Um, and the Jews knew also that this wasn't the ultimate. So some of the prophets prophesied to a day where there would be a new covenant um, beyond just the sacrifice of of the goats and the lambs. And so I'm going to read this from the book. Well, this is from Hebrews, but it's pointing back to a passage in Jeremiah where it says, The day will come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant, so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds so they will understand them, and I will write them on their hearts so they will obey them. I will be my God, and they will be my people. And then later down it says, And I will forgive them for their wrongdoings, and I will never again remember their sins. So this prophecy was one that was in the minds of first century Jews at this time. They, were, they knew that something was coming, there was a day coming, where it wouldn't be just about the blood of the lambs and sacrificing the goats, and um, that there would be a day where it would actually be this ultimate fulfillment 
where we are going to be able to live in this freedom that God offers. And so Jesus, in saying that he is ushering in this new covenant, is saying that the time is coming. The time is almost here where this new covenant will be, where the old covenant will be non-existent and this new covenant will be ushered in. And this, Hebrew says, was actually God's ultimate plan all along. Like he likes the new covenant, Hebrew says, better than the old one. It's like he didn't ultimately want this level of separation between us and him, where we had to go through this sacrificial system, where it was this, I will bless you if um, you follow, but I will have to curse you if you disobey. Like, this system was not his ultimate for us. But this new covenant that we have through Jesus is his ultimate plan, where we see the fullness of reconciliation between us and God. We see the fullness of redemption. And some of this is still yet to come, right? So we don't ultimately see the fulfillment of God's kingdom fully manifested here on earth yet, right now, right? We still see sickness. We still see pain. We still see injustice. We still see those things in our world right now. But we can look forward to the day when that will ultimately happen. And this was a marking point that kind of initiated the start of that coming here on earth. So we see that as Jesus says, this is the new covenant, that he is pointing to also the fact that, again, he is the spotless lamb that will ultimately atone for all of the sins. That it also mentions in Hebrews that, that the blood of the, the animals was kind of like, I heard it explained as like a credit card charge, where it's like, okay, it like puts off the judgment, but ultimately that bill needs to be paid. And so Jesus is the ultimate atonement that paid the entire bill, right? There are no more charges. That card is defunct. And he doesn't see our sins anymore through the blood of Jesus. So when Jesus is having this meal with his friends, I think one of the reasons why he's so excited is to be like, guys, like the time is here. Like this thing that we've been longing for for so long, like we get to be in this time where now we get to see this lived out, where the old covenant has passed away and the new is coming. So we see this meal where Jesus is saying, I am the Passover lamb. I am the one who will save you from death. I am the one who will bring freedom from oppressors. And I am the one who will ultimately pay the price for your sins so there is nothing separating, separating us from God. Um, which is a big deal, right? And so I think as we're about to celebrate this meal um, together, as we do every week, the one thing that I also want to note and just pay attention to is that this table that Jesus set with his friends, right? Judas was at this table. No, Jesus, knowing that Judas was going to betray him, did not say to, yeah, Jesus knowing that Judas was going to betray him, did not say to Judas, like, sorry, you have to leave now. This is only for my friends. He kept Judas at the table, knowing that he was going to betray him. And so I just think that's a challenging picture, right? But a beautiful picture of God's heart, of he just so deeply longs to see everyone come to this table, even the ones who are ultimately against him. And he has been intentional in his time of collecting followers and disciples to choose those who are marginalized, who are oppressed, who are not the highest of society, but who are the ones that many people overlook. And so when we think about this table, 
this communion table of the Lord's Supper that we all, um, that is open to anyone, that anyone can partake in, um, we remember that Jesus' heart is for everyone, everyone to be a part of it. And so we usually do some reflection questions after communion, but I want to do a couple before communion today. Um, I think one thing that uh, I want us to reflect on is just based off of that, that Jesus' heart is for everyone, right? Everyone to be at this communion table. I want us to think about, is there someone in your life who it's, it's kind of hard for you to like think about them and want them to be at this table? Maybe they did something that hurt you, that offended you, that was deep and hard, and um, you're like, you know, if I'm honest, I would rather they sit at a different table. But Jesus' heart and Jesus' desire is for everyone to be at this table. So I just invite you to think about that, that if there is one person or multiple people or a people group or just any... <laughs> any person that you're like, man, I would have a really hard time accepting them, I just invite you to give that to God right now. So I invite you to just close your eyes and think about that. And if you're not at a point where you're like, okay, it's time, I need to like get over this, I just invite you to ask God to help you to help you to see that person how he sees that person. You know, I think God is, is gracious and is patient with us. And so if that is the case for you, I just invite you to silently, in your hearts, do that right now, to invite God just into that space and to help him show you how he sees that person. also want us to think about, you know, I think we all have people in our lives who we want to see at this table with us, but who are choosing not to be. And so I just invite us to think about right now, who in our lives do we long to see at this table with us? Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend, or a co-worker, or a neighbor. Just who is one person or a couple people who you're like, man, I really wish they could be here with me partaking in this meal, knowing the fullness of what Jesus had to offer. And I just invite you just to pray for that person right now, silently in your heart, just to pray that they would experience the goodness and the fullness that Jesus offers us. So I just invite you to silently do that right now. that this is for anyone, for anyone who wants it, for
for anyone who wants that new life that Jesus offers, um, for anyone who wants that freedom, for anyone who wants that relationship with Jesus, this is for you. Um, but it is a choice, and there is no pressure to partake in that. If you're still on this journey, we welcome you here as you're here on this journey. Um, but we're going to take it together now as a, as a body, as a community, for anyone who would like to partake. So practically, what that looks like is um, if you want, you can come up the center aisle, take a piece of bread and a cup of juice. There's gluten-free in the middle. Um, and then you can return to your seats with the elements, and we'll all take it together. So if you would like that, you can come up now. had thanked God for it, he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This wine is the token of God's new covenant to save you, an agreement sealed with the blood I will pour out for you. Drink the cup. So Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the new life and the freedom that you offer us in your body and in your blood. That you broke it for us. That you shed it for us and that it's out of your deep love for us that you did it. And I pray, God, that we would remember this week the people who aren't currently at the table, that you would put on our hearts to pray for them, to love them. And I pray, God, that we would see your kingdom come even, even, in an even deeper way this week. That we would see people know you and come to you. 
that we would see freedom from prisoners, that we would see your healing, we would see your justice come. And God, I thank you that it's because of your sacrifice that all of that is possible. want to create space for anyone to get prayer who wants it. I know I said that jokingly at the beginning, but we really do. So if there is something that you came in with this morning that you would like prayer for, um, please don't leave without getting it, whether that's grabbing someone you came in with and asking them to pray for you, um, anyone from our leadership team, myself, Gail, Zach, um, would also be happy to pray for you. Um, And so we invite you to do that. But as we close, I just want us to remember that, you know, as, as Pastor Sh- Gail shared at the beginning, like everything that we do is about love. And everything about Jesus' sacrifice was about love. Um, and we live out of that place of love, is what he calls us to do. So to close, I just want to read this passage from, from Romans, where Paul is talking about God's love. He says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us as we, if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or cold or in danger or threatened with death? Even the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't and life can't. The angels can't and the demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away. Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord.